Okay. Today we are going to talk about uh, blind source separation, as we already promised. Uh, blind source separation is uh, we can say one of the consequences of the PCA somehow. So in many cases PCA were found very useful but uh, there were some cases that PCA couldn't be successful and researchers tried to figure out what's exactly the reason why PCA cannot work in those uh, problems. So they realized that when we have different components which are independently running in the background and the signal as a result of these uh, activities is grabbed by the sensors and uh, now you want to separate the signals the projection by itself is not sufficient so as you can remember in PCA what we were doing was to do the projection over a linear subspace or a hyperplane a linear hyperplane with the maximum variance in such a way that the projection, the projection of the data over the linear hyperplane or the linear subspace could give us the maximum variance. It was very useful, but in some cases, as you can remember when we were talking about the PCA, I used an example from uh, Professor Nathan Kuhns. He he was explaining the PCA with this dynamic system that you are trying, for example, to have a, a mass which is hanged by a spring. And the real dynamic of such a system would be in this direction, depending on the, the force that you are applying for example here but the point was that if you were recording this dynamic using different cameras for example and if you had a bit of fluctuations in one other dimension than this one for example if you were using the uh, gravity and a bit of fluctuation to this direction then your, your directions, your active directions or your active components should be in two-dimensional space. One of them with the maximum variance and the other one with the minimum variance. But not more than that. So if you can record such a dynamic with 10 cameras in in, 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 after doing the process, after doing the PCA, you will figure out that the only active elements or the only active components are just first two components. One is in the direction of the gravity and the other one is in the direction which you can see a bit of fluctuation. And this fluctuation in many cases would be because of, for example, the noise. So that noise might be, for example, the shaking of the hand of uh, a person which uh, the, the person who is uh, actually taking this system or I don't know maybe uh, maybe the wind or something something else so the real dynamic would be the first component that gives you the maximum eigenvalue in the SVD when we were using the SVD for the PCA now the point is that Sometimes you are recording, for example, a dynamic, but it's not just a single dynamic. For example, you, you, you have two different dynamics working at the same time. If the, there are two different dynamics and you're recording using 10 cameras, what happens in this case? Whatever you do, you will not be able to figure out 
you know, you, you will get definitely after doing the PCA, you will get, for sure, you will get the, the most important dynamics. But you will not be able to discriminate these dynamics, whether they belong to the first or to the second. So there are two completely independent dynamics running at the same time. Completely independent dynamics running at the same time. And using the PCA, you would not be able to separate them to say that, okay, this part of the eigenvalues belong to this one and the other part belongs to that one. So you will not be able to separate the background or the underlying sources using just, this, just the PCA. In, in many cases, it happens like that. So that's the motivation of, that was actually the motivation of a new theory that came across around 1985 uh, by researchers in, in a project which was mostly related to the uh, biologic systems. So they figured out that there is only one nerve that comes from the joints and the knee to the brain. But that single nerve contains two signals at the same time. One signal is the intensity of you know, opening or closing your knee and the other one is how much you want to open it or close it. So the theta or the degree of which you want to open or uh, to stretch your knee. So one nerve is containing all the information and that nerve is going to the brain. So both of these signals are somehow mixed together in one sensor, assuming that this nerve is just one sensor. So there are two signals in one sensor. And the brain is able to separate these sources. So it can figure out very simply that how much should be this intensity and how much the theta of, uh, of which that you have to open or close your knee. That was the motivation first time that uh, Christian Jutten and Harold in uh, Grenoble in France, they came up with a, with a uh, recurrent neural network for the first time that was able to actually separate the, these two sources at the same time. And afterwards, when they presented their first algorithm in 1986 in a conference, there were a lot of researchers that were actually making fun of them because they were saying that your equation, your linear equation, uh, system of the equation, is actually uh, rank deficient. So it's not possible to find a solution for such a system. Mathematically, there is no solution for that. But they could show that using the assumptions and using those, uh, you know, the some of the priors that we have for the real signals completely, you know, in a different way that the mathematicians face with the problem. You can actually find some solutions for that. And they, you know, the more the mathematicians went through, uh, through proving that this, this solution, the solution for such kind of problem is impossible, they were actually developing the background mathematics for a new theory which was coming across and it was the blind source separation and starting with the independent component analysis. So Pierre Camon and Hai Varenen from Finland and many many other people they actually started to develop the basic mathematics that was necessary to prove that such a system would exist and will work in practice. The only thing that was making this, this type of problem different from the others was how to contain and incorporate the priors. So if you can incorporate the priors in the right way, you would be able even to find solutions for linear system of equations which previously mathematicians uh, they believe that there is no solution for that. 
So after this history of source separation, let's come back to one slide that I already showed that during the uh, microphone array systems. So we already talked about the beamforming. When you have a geometry of the uh, microphone uh, array, then you would be able to, when you know the position of the microphones exactly, and if you can using the TDOA methods or GCC methods, SRP methods, whatever, for localization actually, and if the, the one who is talking is stationary, doesn't move actually, using this, the, the, those three algorithms which I mentioned already, you can direct these set of microphones and using the gains that you're giving to these microphones, you can actually steer toward the desired speaker. So that's a very, uh, you know, there's a very nice uh, correspondence between these two blind cell separation and beamforming ideas. And actually, I've never seen anywhere to talk in this way. So that's a new vision of how these two ideas, these two theories, blind source separation and beamforming, they can relate to each other. And I'm going for the first time to bring this idea in, into my thesis. So, in my opinion, beamforming is nothing but a blind source separation with some added priors. So, the more general theory is source separation. And what it says is that it doesn't consider a noun geometry for the microphones. That's the only difference. And knowing this geometry, I will see later, and I will prove it, that what is the actual prior that it gives you when you have the noun geometry? So, for the blind source separation, we assume that the sensors have no, not, you know, a, a noun geometry. So, there might be, but we don't know that. We assume that they are only distributed in the environment, whatever environment is that. If it's for the acoustic signal, so the sensor which is proper for the acoustic signal is nothing but microphone. And we assume that there are a number of the microphones just distributed around. And they are independently grabbing the signal, acoustic signal, which is running in that environment. So we are looking for a kind of demixing filter. So what we get here in the input is just a signal together with noise and probably a lot of other interferences and so on. We are looking for a kind of system, preferably a linear system, because of all the properties that the linear systems give us. We are looking for a linear system in such a way that output of the linear system gives us exactly or a very good estimation of the sources which are recorded by the sensors. What I say by the estimation of the sources means the clean sources without noise. But the structure of BSS forces us to, to have a feedback. So, it's not magic to say that, okay, just I'll get the signal and I'll put the filter here and I'll get the sources. So, you need to, to, to have a compromise between the inputs and outputs and the parameters of the system in such a way that something, you know, realizes. So, we get some feedback from the output and we try to do something, which I've already mentioned here, but that's the idea of blind cell separation, the beginning, that was the idea. Using the information or belief or prior, whatever that is mentioned already in the machine learning methods. So using the prior knowledge that we have about the environment, about the sources, about the mixtures, about whatever related to this equation, 
using those priors and taking the feedback, I do a kind of process and I change the parameters of this filter in such a way that I get the best estimation of those sources in the output. That's the general idea of blind source separation. Example of blind source separation you can find everywhere. So that was an emerging theory I can say from 1996 until now. So from around 1996 that started a lot of conferences and workshops uh, for ICA and now they are you know progress a lot and they are improved so we have the conference ICA IV just you know I think within the next two or three weeks that will launch in uh, probably in Germany so and people started actually to think about how are the different problems in the BSS and how they can be solved so one of the one of the ideas, for example, you have two sources and one microphone. And so, assuming that the environment is anechoic, which means that the source, every source, will just be recorded as the attenuated version. So we have the A times S1. And A is always the attenuation. In real systems, it's not. Uh, it's, you know, like that you, you give a game. Normally it's attenuation version. And B of the second source, which they are mixed together. So this kind of mixture is called instantaneous mixture. Instantaneous in time. So the basic assumptions is that everything we have in time and then what happens in the transform domain it depends on the transform so the core of the main domain is time domain for the signals or we can have for example two microphones and two different sources like the, the, the acoustic of a car or a, uh, a plane and then you will grab by these two microphones, if you don't know any kind of geometry or the position of that, you will get A times S1 plus B times S2, a superposition of them, and C times S1 plus D times S2. Just using the simple mathematics from the high school, you know that there should be a kind of, you know, there's a condition for such a system to be solved. So, what is the condition? The condition is here for the A, B, C, and D. That such kind of condition inequality should, uh, uh, should be realized if you want to be able to find the solution for that. Why? So, assuming that the signal in the microphone X1 is a times S1 plus B times S2 and X2 C times S1 plus B times S2 that means X is a matrix A, B, C, D times S1, S2 So, naming this matrix as A, so this is A S. X equals to A S. You want to get S. Assuming that you know A, that's just an assumption, that you know A, if you know that, S is nothing but A inverse X if you know A but how you can find an inverse of a matrix 
Exactly. So you should have a non-singular matrix. If the matrix is singular or the determinant of the matrix is zero, you will not be able to find any inverse for that matrix. And what is the determinant of this matrix? So this should be everything but not zero. So or just divided by B and D on the other side. So you see that A D shouldn't be equal to BC. That's the condition. If this condition holds, then the matrix is invertible and probably you can find it. Any question? In this case, X is also known. X is always known. Not just in this case. X is the signal of the sensors. So that's the observation. Because X is the observation, so you always know X. The problem is that you don't know S and you don't know A and in many cases, it's not just like that. It's A S plus N, which means that you don't know signal, you don't know the mixture, and you don't know the noise because it's by itself a random signal. And you just know this part, but you want to find the solution for all those three parts. That's why the mathematicians were doing challenging with the engineers that you're crazy, you want to find a solution for such kind of thing. And even, in even, you're trying to find a solution for underdetermined case or overdetermined case, which by itself, if you even know the A, you would not be able to find a solution for that. You know that for overdetermined case, when you have more number of the equations than the number of the unknowns, there is no solution for that. And in the other way around, if you have underdetermined, I will explain about that. If you have underdetermined equation, which means you have less number of equations than the number of unknowns. For example, you have two equations, but three unknowns. Then there should be infinitely many solutions for such kind of linear system of equation. But what of, you know, which, which, which one of these solutions is the one that you're looking for? There's no use if you cannot find a unique solution for an equation, otherwise it's useless. But engineers said, using some kind of priors and realizing some conditions, you will be able to find solution even for these kind of ill-posed problems. You know, all these types of problems are called inverse problems. They are inverse problems because you're trying to, you just have this observation and using an inverse system, you want to get S and noise is not important, but S is important. Or for example, you want to get A. All these, you know, when, you, when you're not able to directly get the solution out of the observations that you have, the problem is called inverse problem. And this, you know, for the Blaisdell separation, there are many cases that you have ill-posed inverse problem. So it's not only the inverse problem, but it's ill-posed. Ill-posedness. Uh, in linear algebra has a definition and the definition is that you know, the condition number is pi so it means that for example the matrix is close to singular the mixture is close to singular for mathematicians it's a point of stop but we should go further using priors you should some you know using some kind of conditions so, very simple case, which was actually emerged by adaptive filter, the father of the adaptive filters, Wiener and Hof, was that 
assuming one of these signals that we are looking for, S1 or S2, uh, the sensor related to that signal is very close to that signal. It's just an assumption. So, if you have a kind of problem, if you're very lucky and one of these sensors that you're getting the signal with is close to this, uh, the source, one of the sources, for example the S2, then you will be able, even without going through the blind source separation methods, just using adaptive filters to find a solution for that. And what is the solution? The solution of a winner filter. But in an adaptive manner. So adaptively, using the equations which are called withdraw and half equation. We already explained that. It's exactly the same as Yule Walker equation. It's just a least square solution, the minimizing least square solution error. You can find a solution for, for such kind of system. So you'll have an error, assuming that the signal is close to this one, to the source. So you want to find a filter. This filter is actually giving you the attenuation or part of this A matrix, this mixture matrix. But how do you find this? Well, you just construct such kind of structure and then you say that, okay, the error in the output should be minimized. And you get a feedback from the output for this system, for this filter. Then, using the same idea as winner filter, linear prediction, all the least square solutions, you want to minimize the square of the error in the output. Using that, you will be able to get this filter. So, it means that you, you will be able to simplify the A matrix, or you will get a kind of estimation of the A matrix. But the point is that, what happens if there is no reference? So this reference means that your, your sensor is close to that uh, source. But if that condition is not holding, what is the solution? That's the motivation for the blind source separation theory. So, in general, the structure for the blind source separation is that you have some unknown sources, S of T, a vector of this, all the sources, S1, S2, whatever. They are mixed using a function, which we don't know that. And you are observing X of T, that's your observation. You want to, to find a system, preferably linear, like g of t to estimate the sources that's going to happen for all the samples of the signal from time 1 until time t one of the assumptions the first assumption is that the mixing matrix A the first assumption is that the mixing matrix A is full rank or regular, so it's not rank deficient. Well, we are just in the emerging theory, so it's better to start with the simplest case. If we can find a solution, then we can generalize it to other worst conditions. In the beginning, for the blind source separation, they assume that the matrix A is regular or full rank. So there is no rank deficiency. And what does rank deficiency mean? When the matrix A is rank deficient, it means that some of the observations are just the linear combination of the others. So there is no extra information getting those signals, getting those sensors. 
It's just a redundant information. So it means that the matrix is not full rank. And you have less number of equations than necessary. And as a consequence, we assume that A is square matrix. So we have, for example, two sources. We need two observations. And the matrix A is full rank. The second assumption is that the linear filter, which we are going to find out as B, is the separating matrix. So we are trying to find B such that separates the sources S1 and S2, for example. But the, the core of these assumptions is the last one. Sources are mutually independent. Is that a reasonable assumption or not? To, to assume that the sources are mutually independent. It is. Because sources are generated by different... So, so the signals are generated by different sources. And it's a completely reasonable assumption to, to say that they are independent. If, for example, we have two people talking at the same time in a room and we have two microphones. Is that true to say, is that reasonable to say that these signals coming from these two different people are independent? Of course it is. Sources are coming from different people and everyone has its own system of generating the acoustic source. The vocal tract, the vocal cords, the filters in the lips and the mouth, they are all different parameters. And that's the reason we can you know, reasonably say that the signal, speech signal coming out of the source one is different and independent from the one in the source two. Moreover, things that, for example, Michael is thinking about and speaking about is quite different from, for example, Ali. They are thinking differently. So cognitively even, they are generating two different sources, even conceptually different. It's not only based on the, the essence or the physics of generation, but also cognitively, they are producing something quite different based on their own mind. At least for the speech source, it's completely true to say that they are different and independent sources. Using this independent, we will get many things and the ICA algorithm as a result. So, ST is unknown. And we cannot compare Y of T to S of T. We will see later why. Because we have this imposed inverse problem that we only see this observation and we have this much unknowns on the right hand side. It's not possible to say that, okay, I will estimate the sources S1, S2, so, and we name it as Y1, Y2, based on this definition. You will not be able, you can try, based on all of these assumptions, to find the best estimation of the sources. But there are two things, they are called there are two uncertainties or indeterminacies that nobody can solve that. One of them is, well, it's not, we can try to, to, to solve it in some, using some kind of other project. But in general, in IC, one is that we cannot say what has been the original energy of the source. So I'm trying to estimate the source, but I'm not sure about how much should be the scale of that, using the energy, I mean. So source one, Michael has already spoken with some intensity. I will try to recover the source from Michael 
But I'm not sure the intensity that I'm recovering after the process is exactly what Michael was starting to, to talk with. That's the first in uncertainty. The second one is that I just try to estimate S1 and S2, but I'm not sure if the permutation is okay or not. So maybe Y1 and Y2 are corresponding to permuted sources. So permutation and scaling are two uncertainties in IC algorithms. We can try to separate, but we're not sure about these two indeterminacies of the algorithms. What is independence? From a statistical point of view, independence for a probability distribution, the joint probability distribution, means that the joint probability should be equal to the product of the probabilities. That's the meaning of independence. So P of Y1, Y2, with the realized versions, with the realized, uh, realized random variables taken out of Y1 and Y2, and we name it, for example, U1 and U2, it should be equal to the product of every single independent source for two random variables. And when it goes for the n random variables, the joint product of all the variables altogether should be the product of all, all the single independent variables. But you'll see that this is a very strong assumption. And how can it be hold, held, for example, for uh, more than two sources? It's really hard to, to realize that, whether they are independent or not. So the idea was continuous of the independence. So let's see about the characteristic functions. Phi. The characteristic function is somehow the Fourier transform of the probability density. We know that based on the Parseval theory, the information of the signal in the time domain and in the frequency domain will not change. Whatever you have in all the domains are the same. And because characteristic function is the Fourier domain of the PDF, it means that the information of the PDF would be also seen in the characteristic function. So that's taken from this equation. And you see that this is just the Fourier transform. So they have the same information. And taking the log, we'll just simplify the multiplication into the summation here. On the other hand, we know that from statistics that the Taylor extension of the log of the characteristic function, every coefficient is the cumulant of random variable. So for that random variable, if you want to, to, to actually obtain the cumulants, every order of the cumulants, you just take the log of the characteristic function and do the Taylor expansion, get every coefficient of the Taylor expansion terms, and it gives you the cumulants. So for the joint PDFs, because we had log and we had the summation, so that's the, the, the Taylor expansion. And for example, the first one here is the mean. The second one is the variance, but the third one is skewness. The fourth one is called kertosis, and for the higher degrees, there is no name for it. But they all, you know, have a kind of meaning. So mean, we know what is it. Variance is somehow like energy. Skewness is a tendency. For example, for a PDF. 
if the PDF is like a Gaussian, what is the skewness? Does this kind of PDF have any kind of tendency to the right or to the, to the left? No. So the skewness is zero. But for, for example, if, if this is a, I don't know, Rice, O'Reilly PDF, then there is a kind of tendency toward right hand side. So every PDF that has a kind of tendency toward some direction, right or left, the value for the third cumulant would be something. Something other than zero. What is the fourth cumulant? Kurtosis. What is kurtosis? Kurtosis is the picketness of the PDF. For the Gaussian, the picketness is zero. It's not picked, it's completely smooth. The most smooth and flat PDF is Gaussian. Why? Because if you take the infinite number of derivations, infinitely many number of the derivations around the zero, and Taylor series is around the zero point, infinite many number of the derivations, they are all zero in, in zero. So it means that it's completely maximally flat at this point. That's why the Gaussian only has mean and variance and nothing more. But every other PDF contains infinitely many number of cumulants because it's a polynomial. And for the real signals, it turns out that all the real signals they have, uh, uh, they are called other, uh, either super Gaussian or sub Gaussians. For example, a speech signal is super Gaussian, just like this. And you have a very high kurtosis, very high kurtosis. So the picketness, the degree of picketness is called kurtosis. These are discriminant features, so they can use it for. Then from the PDFs, you can use it for many source separation algorithms. So, when we say independence, using this theory of the cumulants and the uh, log of the characteristic function, by independence we mean all the cross cumulants should be cancelled, should be zero. But there are infinite many number of the cumulants. So what, what should we do? So we, we, we see that the PDF, joint PDF, should be the product of the PDFs. It means the characteristic function should be product of the characteristic functions, but the log is the sum of the logs. And there should be no cumulant that contains the log of V1 and V2 together. So all the cross cumulants should be zero. They should just depend on their own cumulants. There should be no cross cumulant and all should be cancelled. But there are infinite number of them. How can you follow that to say that, okay, now these PDFs are independent? It's almost impossible. So we have developed a theory, but we don't know how to go to, to the solution. So the idea was very good, but how to implement it is a problem. There was an idea of kullback liber divergence. We already know that. What is kullback liber divergence? It's a measure to say that how much a PDF is close to another noun PDF. <coughs> So you have a bunch of data somewhere. And that bunch of data follows a kind of PDF. You don't know that. But you want to figure out how much this bunch of data, the PDF of this bunch of data, is close to, for example, for example, a Gaussian PDF, which is now. Or a super Gaussian PDF like the Gamma PDF, Laplace PDF. So the measure which can 
simply say that is the Kullback Library divergence. How much you are diverged from a noun PDF. And that's the equation. How much F is close to G? You just take the integral. For the simple case, for one dimensional PDF, just take one integral. Forget about the multiplication of the integrals. So for one dimensional signal, like the speech, how much F is close to G or not? It's just the integral of F times the log of F over G. It's a real number. It gives you a real number. For the product case, you're trying to figure out what Y is in the output and how much this Y is close to the you know, different uh, to the t uh, product of the, uh, the, the individual Y's. That's the equivalent li library divergence. But it's very interesting that Kullback library divergence is very close to the mutual information. So you know about the information from the telecommunication or the information theory probably. Information is a measure which is actually with the unit of entropy. You have heard about that probably, the entropy. So, a random signal, a signal which is completely random, every sample of such kind of signal contains the most information because it's completely random. So you cannot expect what should be the next sample. Whatever sample you get contains a lot of information. And the signal, if it's close to something deterministic, or if it's deterministic, the information of every sample is zero. There's no information inside. That's a unit of entropy. So, the entropy of a random variable is denoted using this integral. Depends on the PDF and the log of the PDF. This minus sign in the negative sign of the input. You already know that. So it turns out that the mutual information, which if you can, if you see the mutual information in the top equation, and previously the Kullback library divergence, you see that they are the same. So. The mutual information between the joint variables by one, two, three, whatever, is the sigma over the entropies of each of these variables minus the entropy of the joint variables altogether. That is the definition. And separately, you can see that. So, how can we incorporate that <coughs> into the in IC algorithm? I will finish recording. Okay. So, after five minutes break, we can continue.